as you can see, Christmas is coming and I'm here in the North Yorkshire town of Malton to find out why residents here are celebrating a book that's never gone out of print. Charles Dickens' classic, A Christmas Carol. And I'm here in Carlisle rapping, not Christmas presents, Christmas carols. We go behind the scenes of the greatest story ever told as the Bible is put to music at Wembley Arena. And we catch up with our German and British families as they meet up in Ypres for the 100th anniversary of the World War I Christmas Truce. And we've some fantastic music from around the UK, from Cumbria to Kent, plus the classic carol, O Little Town of Bethlehem, to sing along to. But first, as the countdown to Christmas continues, we begin with a rousing gospel song, fitting for the Advent season. Many of us are familiar with A Christmas Carol and the character of Ebenezer Scrooge. Humbug! But I'm tracing Dickens' inspiration for this story of redemption to an unexpected corner of North Yorkshire, beginning at St Mary's Priory Church in Old Moulton. Charles Dickens travelled here in 1844 to attend the funeral of his great friend Charles Smithson. Today, the inscription is hard to make out, and this Charles, unlike Dickens, has largely been forgotten. But it's this friendship that puts Moulton at the heart of A Christmas Carol. Dickens spent time here in Moulton. The bells of St. Leonard's Church are the bells that feature in the book. And here on Chancery Lane are the offices where Dickens met his solicitor friend, Charles Smithson. These offices were the inspiration for Scrooge's counting house and even this door knocker makes an appearance in the story. Jacob Marley. Today this place is a museum to a Christmas carol. Local resident and familiar face Selena Scott has some insider information. 
Selina, you've a very special connection to Malton and Dickens, haven't you? Yes, my grandfather became the editor of the local paper here, the Malton Messenger. Uh, and as a little girl, I remember him clearly telling me all about Charles Dickens and all about A Christmas Carol. Scrooge and his love of money, they're the real villain of the piece, aren't they? Yes, he was a miserable old man. And uh, the reason A Christmas Carol resonates through all the centuries is the fact that everyone can see that this man represents someone they either know or a little bit of something that they have inside of themselves, which is the pursuit of money at, at all costs. But essentially, it's a story of redemption. Yes, thanks to the three ghosts of Christmas past and present and future who came to him on Christmas Eve and basically pushed him out of his miserableness towards his fellow man. So he changed. And that's, what, that's what's so compelling about the book, that we, we feel better about it when we finish it. Beautiful morning. Do you agree that Dickens had Christian intentions when, when he wrote this book? Yeah, absolutely. He was so concerned about the poor, and particularly about the children in Victorian society. And he used this little book as a way of turning people's minds and focusing people's minds on this problem in their midst. And certainly I, I think that the message through it all is one of the Christian religion and, and how we can all do more. And, uh, and certainly Dickens himself, in letters that he wrote to the Smithson family, um, says it quite clearly, that he, he believes in Christianity and this is his expression of it. But the story doesn't end here. You've actually got something very valuable in Malton. Yes, we've got a rare treasure. Uh, it's tucked away in a safe just around the corner from here. Say no more, Selina. We shall hear more about that later. But right now, let's enjoy a Christmas carol that the redeemed Scrooge would have approved of. Christmas 1914 and the Great War is locked in stalemate, costing thousands of lives. Last week we met two families, one German and one English. They're travelling across Europe to the place where their relatives met 100 years earlier. 
They're the descendants of Private William Tapp and Lieutenant Kurt Zemish, who both kept diaries as the Christmas truce unfolded at this very spot near Ypres in Belgium. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Hi, Merry Christmas. Don't you think it's amazing that a hundred years ago our grandfathers met purely down to fate? Yes. And then now, a hundred years later, we're doing exactly the same thing. Yes. Fate's brought us together. Yes. Historian Alan Reed has also made the journey to provide expertise on the truce. Do you want to know a bit more? Oh, yes, yes indeed. Mm -hmm. So if you look at this map, it shows you where we are exactly. Mm -hmm. So in front of us would have been the British front line, mm -hmm. and behind us would have been the German mm -hmm. front line. Mm -hmm. So the Warwicks came across mm -hmm. and met more or less behind you, uh, Luke. So then on Christmas Eve, as the Germans, mm -hmm. we started the hymn singing. Mm -hmm. you know, home yes. sweet home, heilige Nacht. Ja, yes. genau. <laughs> and of course the Warwicks <laughs> responded. Yeah. Yeah. And so there was a bit, a bit of banter going on. And then on Christmas Day, they all came out. Now, do you want to see a famous photograph that was taken at this very spot? Yeah, mm -hmm. that would be amazing. These two are Warwick soldiers, you know, mm -hmm. the, the old Bills, as mm -hmm. we call them. I All see. the others are Germans. Wow. wow. So they're uh, properly mixed in yeah. there. They're probably mixed in, as you can see. Yeah. And then the thing they did as well, which is quite sad but appropriate, they buried their dead. Because mm -hmm. they were dead lying here. Mm -hmm. They could not be buried. So they, they buried their own dead and had a, a bit of a service. It's great to be here today with the uh, two families who, at the time, were on the opposing sides. So, December was one of the wettest months uh, of the year in 1914. Some of the men had waist deep in mud and they were suffering the same condition and then they found a chance where they could stop fighting and became human again. And that's what happened here uh, in, in these fields, you know, in Belgium. Very, very special, very special place. Soon a couple of English brought the football out of their trench and a vigorous football match began. This was all so marvellous and strange. The Christmas truce is synonymous with football, and thanks to the family's diaries, we know a game did take place. We're trying to arrange a football match with them for tomorrow, Boxing Day, and they say they're not going to fire again if we don't. <laughs> Good game. Good game. <laughs> Morgan's brought a football to leave in memory of his relative. The Christmas truce is just a great example of men having faith in each other to not take advantage of sharing no man's land and putting down their weapons. And it's just the best example of how important Christmas is to, to Christian people. Next week, we'll learn what fate befell Private Tap as our families take part in the last post ceremony held every day in Ypres to commemorate those who fell in the Great War. <laughs>